Are you curious about how people think? Are you curious in learning about how you could think like them? That's psychology, isn't it? And I'm thinking maybe that's why a large percentage of salespeople have a psychology degree. Now, it could be other reasons. It could be that uh, to make any money with a psychology degree, you typically need a graduate degree. Uh, and people maybe find out that talking to depressed people or anxious people all day uh, is kind of wearing on you. And the pay uh, until you get that advanced degree may not be that great. And people tend to fall into sales, which is kind of the catch-all career uh, for people out there. Hey, if, if you're good with people, we'll put you in sales. And if you're ambitious, we'll put you in sales. If you're money motivated, we'll put you in sales. Uh, that's the type of conversation we're going to have today. I think what you'll get out of it is how do you make that curiosity into an outward mindset, that mindset that works so well in sales. Because if you're not thinking like a client, you're thinking most likely like a salesperson. And that comes through. And I had this quote on LinkedIn, you know, that the best salespeople think like clients, meaning that they're empathetic. That doesn't mean they're thinking the exact thoughts. It means that they are looking at the world the way the client looks at the world. Because if you're playing chess, do you want to just think about yourself you'll lose because the other person is trying to think about what move would you make? What would you do if you were in their situation? Now, a lot of people have a hard time with this, but I don't think it's so much innate as a developed skill. It's an advanced skill. It's a skill that nobody really teaches. Uh, we all are left to our own to kind of develop this skill. And if you've ever had a pet or a child, you know that this skill becomes immediately required uh, because th they need your help. They cannot survive on their own. So you need to, and sometimes they cannot even communicate. If you ever had a pet that was sick or got fleas or was hurt in some way, they, they can't tell you what's wrong. And they can't tell you what they're feeling and, and how to help them. But they do express it. They sit on your lap. They cry. Uh, they pout. They hide. And we can just ignore this and hope it goes away. Or we can investigate it. But that is selling. Selling is helping somebody else solve a particular problem. And getting them to focus on the the real problem, not just the symptoms of the problem, and to solve it permanently or consistently than just for the moment. Just, you know, because an aspirin can make a lot of things go away. That doesn't mean they're cured, though. It just means that the symptoms are depressed or repressed or delayed until the aspirin wears off. So let's get into this interview. Before we do, I want you to make sure you're checking out CoVideo. Video email has been crazy successful. Video in general, you know, why are people doing it today? Because obvious reasons, people do want to connect. And I made the mistake of not turning the video on during the office hours at the beginning or the one-on-ones. And I'm doing it, I'm purposely doing it now because I think I connect better with the people in the courses. And through email, you can show so much more. But a picture and text, uh, the, have you noticed the attention span on people is really slow right, or very limited now? I'm on social all the time, and it's like it, it's gone from uh, you know a five-minute video down to a one-and-a-half-minute video, and now down to probably even less. Uh, people aren't really thinking. They're not processing. There's too much information for them to process it. They're reacting. So what type of reaction can you get with a video email? 
give it a shot, check it out. They get tons of examples. And if nothing else, you'll learn how to become better <coughs> on video. Also, hey, I've got some friends over at a new startup I want you to check out. If you're having to use Salesforce, and God, believe me, I know the pain. It was one of the main reasons I got out on my own was everyone was forcing that stuff down our throats and we turned into data entry monkeys instead of salespeople. Well, there's a company called Scratch pad all one word scratch like a cat scratches and pad and basically what it does is it simplifies the data entry the automation and it works around the limits of salesforce and its slowness and error proneness and allows you to have a chrome plug-in to very quickly capture information about your accounts because the the point of a CRM is good. We can't memorize all this stuff, but nor do we want to spend our whole day entering stuff that we may or may not use. We do need the stuff. So try it out, scratchpad.com. Let's get into the interview. Hey, Corey, welcome to the show. Is a way of getting started. Give us a little background on yourself. Yeah, thank you so much, Brian. It's a pleasure to be here talking to you today. A uh, bit of a background on myself. I was a psychology major, just like many of the people you interview. I've noticed a pattern there. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder if you're looking at people's credentials on LinkedIn and you're like, oh, psych major, let's do it. <laughs> no, it's just the opposite. <laughs> you yeah. know, I do have the profile up. To go right, up. right, definitely, definitely. But um, I was a psychology major in college. Um, to be honest with you, I never thought I would be in sales. If you saw me growing up and you told me that one day you were going to be in sales, I wouldn't believe you. And that was because I was a total introvert, completely shy. And I think part of that was my perception of sales. My perception was you have to be this extroverted, you know, really aggressive in your face type of person. Soon I would find that that's definitely not how you want to be. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, I majored in psychology, um, thought about going to grad school for counseling, took the GRE and everything, um, didn't really score how I wanted to. And my father had always been in sales. Yeah. Um, he had always done pretty well, technology sales. And I looked up to him. So naturally, what do you do when you're not sure what you want to do next? You sort of follow in your, your father's footsteps. And that manifested in my first job at Enterprise Rent-A-Car, which that's quite, um, quite common that they do a lot of college hiring, don't they? They absolutely do. And it's uh, I'd say it's a great place for people to um, get their communication skills going, deal with the general public, certainly learn a lot of patience if you've ever rented from Enterprise. Well, I've rented a lot of cars. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> I know it's not a, always a friendly crowd. <laughs> I can imagine. I, I can imagine. So you deal with all kinds of people. Uh, many people don't realize this, but the reason it's such a good start for people getting into sales is the protection plans that, that you probably notice they try to sell you every so. single time you rent a car. And obviously that's very different from the B2B sales that I do today, but it was a great foundation for me getting to learn how to talk to people, learn how to communicate, figure out what works for you know getting people engaged and, and selling to their emotions instead of logic because Let's be honest, most people have an insurance policy already. The only way you're going to get them moving in that direction is if you get some emotion involved. So that was a really powerful step for me in my career, definitely. And I see uh, neuro linguistics programming certification. Is that a passion or? Oh, absolutely. I, I love NLP. And I'm, are, are you familiar with NLP? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I love it. I, uh, I'll put it this way. When I left college for psychology, even though I got into sales, I never let the psychology go. The books that I would be reading were NLP, personal development, all kinds of things. And um, also another field related to NLP that I've studied quite extensively that someone might ask, what does that have to do with sales is actually hypnosis. Yep. Um, and there's, there's a couple of things I've taken from that that I'd be more than happy to share with you today. Uh, but I, I did the NLP thing because I've always been passionate about helping people. I think that's really the, one of the key values I brought to the table as a seller. Um, I do like to make money just like everyone else. I always sometimes find that <laughs> interview question kind of cliche, like, you know, why do you want to get into sales? And they kind of expect you to say, oh, I want to make a lot of money. I mean, everyone wants to make a lot of money, in my opinion. 
Um, but it's, it's what's the driving force underneath that. And for me, it's really talking to people and helping people. And when I feel like I'm making a difference, that gets me charged up, that gets me excited and, and further invested. Um, and I've, I've implemented NLP into mainly the communication, the way I talk to clients. Um, I, you know, do a, do a good job of trying to get into rapport with them, just trying to enter their model of the world, the way they see the world, the best that I can, um, to, to really frame myself as a partner that's really with them for a mutually beneficial relationship. Um, so that's kind of the biggest thing I've taken from NLP, but I also use it on myself. I also use it to get my mindset right. And, you know, inner game, in my opinion, is one of the biggest things that I see a lot of sellers miss. Um, they might, you know what I mean? They might take the role too seriously, let that affect their identity and everything. And I feel like I've done a decent job of separating the two, uh, the role and my identity itself and protecting it. And that's allowed me to show up into you know, situations where I don't know the outcome, which is kind of an everyday reality of sales and enter them confidently. So I could show up as my best self and, and find a way to reach the outcome that I'm looking to achieve. Well, let's build off of that because NLP, you know, one of the major contributors was a hypnotist, Ericksonian. Hypnotist. Abs yeah, absolutely. And I've had, um, I had an NLP expert and on the dating side on the show, I'm trying to remember Jeff Ross, do you know him? Or uh, Ross Jeffries. Ross I think Jeffries, you're, you're right. I, I am familiar. Yeah, he created something called uh, Speed Seduction, I believe, which was yeah. kind of a combination of neuro-linguistic programming and hypnotherapy conversationally, you know? Right. And he was the character Tom Cruise played in um, that movie. I'm trying to remember it with the frogs that came down like rain. Yeah, I can't remember the name either. Maybe it'll come to us later. Yeah, begin with an M, I think. But anyways, how, how have you applied hypnotism to sales? Well, I get out a pocket watch in every call and I yeah. hypnotize my client into buying. <laughs> the little spinning kaleidoscope. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, on the real, I, I really do more the conversational type of hypnotherapy, which as you said, and, and that's awesome, you're familiar, Ericksonian hypnotherapy, which was yeah. created off of one of the greatest psychologists and hypnotherapists on the planet, Milton H. Erickson. And yeah. some of the biggest pieces I've taken from Ericksonian hypnosis, uh, one of the biggest ones is a core principle of that modality and it's utilization. So utilizing what someone says in a conversation in the way you communicate to them. And what does that do? It increases rapport, it increases connection. It helps them see you as someone who sort of gets them. And at that point, you can really position yourself better as a trusted advisor. And, you know, I just got the realization that, you know, that outward mindset, I'm probably thinking that maybe NLP is something that could really help reps do that. Because I got a lot of reps in my course that struggle with that, how to think like the other person. Mm hmm because that's the most rapport building, right? Because you start using their words, uh, their modalities, and you start to connect with them instead of having them come meet you, which doesn't work that well. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Um, I, I think that is is definitely a huge challenge. I do my best to, to overcome that challenge. And the utilization helps a lot. And in order for me to utilize people's language, I have to be fully present. I can't yeah. be sitting here thinking about what Playing I'm going to say next. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's like, I may not seem like it now, but that's where like the core introvert inside me comes into handy because I have previously before sales, I was always a really good listener. I would always pay attention to the key details. And that's another NLP principle called sensory acuity or situational awareness. awareness yeah. If I, if you have your camera on, we're on a sales call and I see you getting uncomfortable based on something you're, you know, I said, I can really try to either elicit what's making you feel that way and try to correct course and change in a different direction where it goes smoother. Or I can, um, you know, find a way to, to professionally bring it up and, and decide to pivot the conversation in another way. So I think it takes a lot of presence. And that took me a long time to learn because uh, when you first get into sales, as you know, I the first B2B sales job I ever had 
was like many people in SDR, um, mm -hmm. working for a web development agency, making 80 dials a day. And, and we had that power dialer thing from inside sales. So it was like, I couldn't even take a breath before the next call. I was like exhausted. It felt like I was running a marathon by the end of the day. <laughs> yeah. Now let's go back to like, did you consider yourself an introvert or were you just shy or both? I think it was a combination of both. Um, I was definitely shy when I was younger. And I think that's partially what drew me to psychology and personal development because I was- You didn't want to be shy. Forward. Right. I was like, so how do I overcome this? It seems like yes. people have done it. Uh, Tony Robbins was the first yeah. person I came across that really helped me um, change that, start to look at myself in a different way and kind of audit my life and say like, look, what patterns am I running here that are leading me to be this way? Um, and that definitely helped even before I started to learn some of the communication things of NLP and stuff like that. And was there a breakthrough? Did you go to one of his programs or did you just read his book or because he puts NLP in a much more consumable. Right. He, he's a great spokesman for it. And he does the classic rename it to something else. Right. Right. Uh, I would say the, the audio programs, I would, I would yeah. be, no matter where I was driving, I would have a Tony Robbins audio program on my favorite was personal power too. Um, and that, that just skyrocketed my confidence. It got me asking better questions. It got me interrupting my own patterns. And funny enough, um, the pattern interrupt itself, I feel like is such a hugely overlooked sales skill in a communication, uh, setting, um, that, that I do definitely apply when, you know, I'm talking to someone and they start to take the conversation in a direction that is not really conducive for us, you know, right. getting to the mutually beneficial outcome. I can throw in a pattern interrupt like, well, hang on a second, let's take a step back. And I remember earlier you asked a question about this. Then I asked questions again, who's in control of the conversation now? I am, right? So it's- But with questions versus ex exactly. statements. Yeah. Right, <laughs> right. I think that that's the, the distinction a lot of reps miss. Right, absolutely. Um, it's, it's not, um, and, and it's funny because I, I feel like most people before they get into sales, I was definitely like this. I used to imagine the salesperson as the one doing all the talking. And, you know, obviously, I don't know why it's framed like that in like popular culture. Um, it's entertaining. It's so, Nobody wants guess, to watch somebody so. listen, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good point. I never thought about it that way, but it's really- uh, Two hours of this. <laughs> It could not be further from the truth. And I think that's partially why when I was younger, I was like, oh, I would never want to do sales. I was like myself talking in front of a group for extended periods of time. Um, but soon I realized that the listening was was a lot more important. Just the, the presence and asking good questions, not wasting questions. Um, that's something I did a lot when I first started. I would, you know, I didn't really know what questions to ask. So I would ask some questions that were like yes or no. And they didn't give me as many questions. And, and when you ask too many questions, they get a bit of fatigue, almost like an interrogation. And so I've learned later on to ask more meaningful questions that are going to get more information so I can ask the you know, minimum amount that I need. And also the questions that are going to um, get them engaged, really not the stuff they hear every day from other sellers, you know? And, and that's another distinction because people, you know, when they hear questioning skills, they go, no one wants to be interrogated. And, and you're right but everyone wants to talk about themselves. People mm -hmm. don't go to therapy to hear what the therapist has to say. Mm -hmm. They go to therapy to tell the therapist what they want somebody oh, yeah. to hear. Right? <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> <laughs> right? And the therapists don't talk much. Not it, at all. It, it's all like, well, what do you think's behind that? How does that make you feel? Right, right. What's important about that to you? What will that, what will that do for you? You know, stuff like that. And then people leave feeling 50 pounds lighter because this thing that's been compressed inside them has been released. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what a great sales call is. Right. It's like when you've really gotten in into what they're facing and how you can help and showing a possibility. Absolutely. Not educating, right? Mm -hmm. Because anybody can go on YouTube and get educated. <laughs> Boy, do we hear that a lot, <laughs> educate. <laughs> uh, right, and it's like, it's just, <laughs> again, the, the devil's in the details, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. it's, it's how it's perceived. Now, how about like the uncomfortableness? How long did it take you to get through that? 
when you got into sales? Because clearly that was an obstacle for you. Definitely. Well, when I was in SDR, um, because the closing role and the SDR were very different for me. Um, When I got into closing, it's a completely different game. But for the SDR role, I would say probably just because the sheer amount of calls I was making, maybe like two months until I started to realize. um, And it's funny, I would I would experiment because I was doing so many calls a day that I was like, what have I got to lose? Like, I mean, there's so many people I'm calling. Why don't I try this? And and one of the things I tried that I I noticed that began to work was um, agreeing with them because they have this pattern they run as soon as they answer the phone. Like, hey, this is Corey with Media Current. That was the name of the company I was working for. And they may say something like, oh, I, I'm busy right now. I'm in a meeting. I can't talk. And then I, I would just agree with them. I'd be like, I'd be like, you're probably right. And then they would just, there would be this silence of like two or three seconds, almost like their brain short circuiting, like, wait, what? Did he just agree with me? And then they would kind of take a step back. And at that point, I could be like, and it, you know, being respectful of your time, I could tell you this really quick. You could see if it makes sense or not. And then you could go on with your day. Does that sound fair? And most of the time when I did something like that, they would give me the time of day and I could actually see if there was anything there. Right. Instead of either fighting the objection or saying, okay, I'll call you later. Because if they were busy, they wouldn't pick up the phone. (laughs) Right, right. (laughs) Exactly. I I had a guy one time. It's funny. You get the funniest calls when you do a lot of calls per day. Uh, One guy that, uh, because we had this localized area code dialer in my SDR job, like many of them do. This, This guy, I think he was in Utah or something. And he was like, he was like, oh, I thought you were my dry cleaner like calling me to pick up my clothes or something. I was just like, what? <laughs> so it, it's just funny how like people get in these trancy patterns of just doing their daily activities and they almost pick up a phone call like unconsciously and just, you know, run a pattern, so to speak. Well, that, that's why the local thing worked or did work. I don't know if it still works or not because right. I, I get them all the time and I know they're not here. <laughs> right. What part of town do you live? Uh, uh. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you could also leverage that because all you have to do is Google the weather or the news for that location. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Start there. But um, what other epiphanies have you gone through? To, to like, because you, you kind of like the brute force, and I think that's good. Mm-hmm. And I, I also think that the the AI call recorders are used in the wrong way. What they should do is for training and just pretend calls you know for yeah. the first two or three months so you, so you just talk to the machine all day and it kind of gives you feedback without any consequence yeah d- definitely i mean i i think uh you got to train a lot before you enter the ring so to speak right. um, if you want to bring a sports metaphor into play yeah so um some of the other big aha moments and and most of the the skills i've acquired in sales even outside of NLP or before NLP, because a lot of people do NLP that don't know it. Um, It's it's kind of just a part of their communication. I would do modeling, which is an NLP principle, find the best performing rep and spend a lot of time with them. Look at what they do, shadow their calls. That was a huge turning point for me because my goal with that wasn't to become them. It was to acquire the skills that they have that work that could fit in with my model of the world, the way I see the world, so I'm congruent and make it mine. And, and some of the biggest things there was um, establishing context really early on, um, which kind of goes into control of the conversation. So how you introduce yourself and the purpose of the call, um, but not doing it in a boring way. Some of the best reps that I, I modeled were people who we're getting the, the, the prospects excited and engaged. And, and I dare I say they would inject playfulness into the conversation. I know what a, what a concept, right? That's not thought- <laughs> <laughs> make it enjoyable. Go figure. Right. Right. And, and I was like, how, how can I do that? And I actually realized that the key was just congruency. It was just being the type of person that I am with my friends outside of the office. Right. What a, what a thought, right? I mean, cause I remember when I first got into the closing role, I did, I was an SDR for about uh, three years at two separate companies. I spent some time at IBM oh. through an acquisition. Uh, so the big blue machine. <laughs> and uh, that, that was quite the experience. I learned a ton there. But when I entered a closing role, 
um, what I noticed, because I was a part of a new team, and it's the same company I work for now called Akamai Technologies. We're one yep. of the largest cloud delivery platforms on the planet. And I noticed that a lot of the reps were having this persona when they were on the call with customers. They would sales voice. A certain way, you know, like, yeah. hey, this is, hey, this is Corey Zender with Akamai. The purpose of today's call is going to you know? <laughs> And like, but then you talk to them after the call and they're like, yeah, man, what's up? You know? And I'm, I'm just like, that's not congruent. So I was like, let me try just being the same person off of the phone that I am on the phone. And I noticed that that really started to naturally establish reports. Not like I was doing anything tricky to get it. I mean, I was just being friendly and empathetic and most importantly, present, um, you know, having an outcome in mind, but not making that so apparent that I'm subcommunicating desperation, you know, like. Yeah, I mean, I, I call it the rep zone where you have the rep voice. <laughs> and the right. problem is the customer or the prospect puts you in the rep zone. Mm -hmm. And once you're in there, you can't get out because you're a rep, it's all about you. And they're thinking, do I need it or not? Most likely not. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's so but, true. <laughs> but you use that model of why don't I just think the way I do when I do engage people, i.e. your friends, mm -hmm. your friends think you're interesting or they wouldn't be your friends, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It works. Why does it work? You're relaxed, you're confident, you're engaging, you show interest in them. Right, exactly. Uh, I know, what, what a concept, right? It's funny, they're so simple. Some of the most powerful sales techniques are so simple when you break them down. Yeah. And you'll see managers do it too. You, you'll be like out in the parking lot before a meeting and they'll be like fun and easy going. And then they get, and they, they tighten their tie up and they talk in the corporate speak and everyone gets turned off. Right. Right. Exactly. Um, it's just being a human being, being someone who is like them, someone that they want to do business with. And, and that, that's the big key with, with uh, market saturation in certain fields is what makes you different because it's, it's great to have an awesome product. That's, a, that's always helpful that you believe in, but it's also great to be able to create an experience on calls. Um, and I don't mean like the type of experience, like when they're trying to sell you a timeshare, I just mean like just a different experience, whether that be always turning on the camera, which I've noticed encourages them to do it yep. or um, just starting off the call differently. Like, Hey, you know, so we're obviously talking for a reason. How can I help you today? That's something they're not used to hearing. Most people are like, oh, the purpose of today's call is, you know. Well, that's it. And, you know, I, I was interviewing a, a startup guy and he would always talk about what he had for breakfast. Really? Yeah. <laughs> not because he wanted to talk about food, but everyone eats breakfast or everyone eats. Right. Right. And most people enjoy a cup of coffee and he likes a croissant. And then... The natural reaction is, well, what did I have for breakfast? Oh, you Starbucks or you Dunkins? Right. Or you're a tea person. And and bo boom, you're on the you're at the human level. Right. Right. Not the rep it, client level. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. It's it's all about differentiation, in my opinion. And what I what I do now is I'm more in an account management role. So it's a completely different world than hunting and trying to find new accounts to sell to. Now I have a patch of about 30 customers, mostly on the West Coast, and I'm responsible for renewals, making sure support cases get taken care of, but also upsells. And it's, yep. it's kind of a new game. And it's been, I started doing this in April. It was my first account management role. And I, I like it. I mean, you're able to um, engage with the customer much differently. It's certainly easier to, to get call, calls with them set up than, than a hunting role because they're an existing customer. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's been, it's been an awesome experience and I, I'm learning so much more about business now in general, and it's helping me better see the world from their perspective, uh, because I'm talking to them all the time now, you know? And how do you develop your, continue to develop yourself, like get into, you know, state management before a call, uh, you know, try and remember what it's, how to get them engaged instead of it just being instinct. Yeah, definitely. That's the hard part because when you first start learning NLP, you're at the level of conscious competence where you have to think about it to do it. Yeah. The goal is to do something enough to where it becomes unconscious competence, so you can, where yeah. you can do it very naturally and smoothly. And 
sometimes I just kind of assume rapport and connection before the call starts. And lo and behold, it will work because what that assumption does to my mind is it's causing my physiology to communicate in a certain way. My camera's on, they could see how relaxed and comfortable I am talking to them. And they feed off of that in, in a certain way, in my opinion. Um, so a lot of it's mindset, a lot of it's uh, believing in yourself and trusting that, you know, you're, you're, you're going to find a way to get to the outcome that you want. You obviously don't know how they're going to respond. You don't know what's going to happen, but being comfortable enough, having done this enough to where you can just allow, you know, in a way, allow your unconscious mind to take the driver's seat and you know what questions to ask, you know where to direct the conversation, et cetera. Um, that's, that's kind of the way I see it is to, to do it in unconscious process and also just being, being humble. Like I, I, you know, I've, I've been a top performer in a lot of roles, but that definitely wasn't always the case. I mean, when I first started closing, I was like, man, this is a lot harder than I thought it was. And, um, you know, I had a, I had a, a, I'll never forget my first deal, obviously most, most reps do. Um, and, and I think I've heard you talk about like, don't necessarily celebrate the first deal too much, like give recognition, but, you know, ask them like, what'd you learn from that? You know, how can we find a way to implement that in other ways? And I've never let that get to my head. Like I'll never view myself as being better than anyone. I feel like I could learn something from anybody, whether that be the prospect or another rep on my team that maybe they're not doing as well as me a particular quarter, because the next quarter they might be shooting the lights out and doing fantastic. So that's kind of the, the mindset I've, I've had is just being a lifelong learner and um, really trying to make these, these quote unquote skills a part of just who I am so yeah. that they're natural. And when you see other reps, what do you see them doing wrong most of the time? Yeah. There's, things they could do better. Well, there, there's a couple of things really. I think, I think sometimes <clears throat> they get too caught up in, in product that they forget the communication piece. Yeah. What I notice a lot is reps losing control of the conversation, especially in my role today. Um, you might be talking with a procurement person in a negotiation scenario. And they, they could hit you with three questions in a row. Like you've got to do a pattern interrupt there. You've got to stop that pattern so you can say, hang on a second, let's take these questions one at a time. You know, what was your first question? Um, and then you go from there. But that's probably the biggest piece is um, not maintaining control of the conversation. Um, and then the second one with an account management role that I've seen is um, agreeing to everyone, never drawing a line in the sand, because um, obviously it's a mutually beneficial relationship. But what that means is there's something in it for you and there's something in it for the client. And if they're trying to push too hard, you got to you got to try to professionally ask for something in return. And I noticed that, you know, some reps don't do that. I mean, they're they're learning, but it's just, uh, you know, those are key pieces right there, as you know. Oh, well, that's a huge trap because when they ask for something, that is the best time for you to ask for something. <laughs> because if you get that, that reciprocation expires very quickly after you've given it to them. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You got that right. It's, yeah. uh... <laughs> then you're like, Hey, remember I did all this stuff for you. It's like, well, that's your job. <laughs> right. Oh yeah. Yeah. They're, they're some of the best, <laughs> best uh, salespeople out there, procurement people, especially some of the more experienced ones. I mean, shoot, when I'm on calls with them, I'm mentally taking notes. I'm like, wait, you said this and it had this effect on me. You know, there's stuff you could learn. There. Well, that's the only fun they get. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's so true. That's so true. Cool. Hey, it's been a fun conversation. Uh, where can people go to connect and follow you? Yeah, definitely. So on LinkedIn, I'm Corey S. Zender. Um, and I also have a website, uh, CoreySender.com, where I have some, some of my, some articles I posted on NLP. I self-published a book on, on mindset on Amazon called Mind Manifestation. That's available if people want to check it out. And yeah, I'm open to anybody reaching out if they want to have a conversation. I, I love talking sales and just, you know, shooting the, shooting the shit, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> when I hear people say, oh, I've been selling for N number of years, and they, they think that that is a credential. It's an element. It's a signal of a certain amount of experience. But when I talk to people about the more I learn about sales, the less I know about sales. And with psychology, and we're dealing with people, and 
people, there, there are commonalities, but there's also cultural differences, generational differences, contextual differences. And it's our job as salespeople to connect with them. Why do we have to connect? Because we have to communicate. And I think today people are thinking far too transactionally. They have a problem. We have a solution. Well, maybe they don't think they have a problem. And maybe we think our solution is a little too good. We're in the middle. We're, we're the person, we're the conduit of connecting those two things. Getting the client to understand the problem behind the symptoms, the implications behind waiting and not taking action now and how they could solve it. But solving it requires risk, money, change. And let's face it, look, look at our own lives. There's probably a half dozen things right now that we like to solve. Maybe health things, maybe home things, maybe auto things, career, all of these things that uh, they're not where we'd like them to be. And there's room for improvement. And if we solve them or even got better at them, our lives would be significantly better. But it requires effort. It requires change, thinking. Uh, we got to burn some calories. We've got to spend some dollars. Ah, Netflix looks pretty good. Pretty, pretty good. But time doesn't wait. There's no pause button. Taking a, a day, a week, a month, a year and pushing it off eh, doesn't, we lose that year. And what's crazy is as we get older, those time slots, those years go by faster. It's our perception, but perception's reality. Do you remember when you went to college? Four years seemed like an eternity. Okay, how's four years seem now? Look back four years ago. Did it go by slow? Was it arduous? Maybe. Maybe if you were in prison or you had a hard time, it went by slow. But typically, it goes by super fast. And today, we can kind of keep track of it a little bit. We've got our camera roll on our phone. Uh, we got We can store all these photos and videos of our life and scroll through or get a reminder if you use Amazon Prime's photo thing. They send you a little alert every day so you can go back years. And, you know, for me at least, one year looks like, you know, snap of a a finger. It goes by so fast. My point is that when we're talking with clients, everyone thinks that status quo is the safest. But typically it's, one of the most dangerous. Think about it right now. Uh, the end of the year will come here before you know it. Will you hit your goal? Will you be w- using your time the most effectively to get your goals, whatever they are? And I think in sales, we, we lose track of it. We get hypnotized in the distraction of busyness, the activity. We assume that just because we're active, we're taking action, we're working, that we're accomplishing something. Try this one little hack. For one to five minutes a day, a week, ask yourself, how could I have used my time better? How could I worked smarter? What was a waste of time? What was the most effective use of my time? If there was a skill that I could get better at, what would it be and how could I get better at it? This I've kind of adopted because you do kind of hypnotize yourself to be comfortable as long as you're busy and working hard. And I'm as guilty as anybody. And the problem is, The hard work thing doesn't scale. It's noble. It's admirable. People love it. It's it's great for memes and quotes, uh, but it's terrible for your health. It's terrible for your personal life. 
And that year is going to go by really fast. And is it getting you what you want? And if you're in sales, you want revenue. Uh, you want to be successful. You want to work on the things that are real and can and will close. Uh, you don't want a bunch of wasted time and rejection. And I think so much of sales is that smarter part. Now, you can't sit around and ponder, and this is what managers always tell me, well, I don't want paralysis by analysis. Well, analysis and paralysis are procrastination. You know, one to five minutes of asking yourself, maybe even write the questions down. What was the best use of my time in the previous day, week, or month? And what was a waste of my time that I have control over and can avoid? And then try and really focus in on it because a lot of the people who come to the course first they got to get a time management or time prioritization skill developed because they get comfortable getting dragged into bs meetings managing accounts that have no revenue uh doing a bunch of corporate stuff crm uh that you know it, it's kind of make work to make work my dashboard's not looking populated. Put some crap in the CRM so it looks good. Well, that doesn't produce revenue. Uh, yes, you got to keep track of things. And people say, well, you're so down on CRM. I'm, I like a C I got two. I got two <laughs> CRMs that I use. One, because it's super great for capturing information on the internet. And the others for real deals progressing through stages. Uh, so I... I'm not against them. I partner with companies that automate this stuff. I just don't think it should be more than 5 or 10% of your time. And it should be to your benefit. And there's a whole lot of ways of capturing this data. And I'm going to do an episode, uh, probably that will be a solo episode, about what I see the future of sales technology be because I think it's too much of it is sales rep required to do data entry as opposed to technology being able to take the vast sums of information out there and prioritize it and condense it to make it usable for us. Now, if you were to ask pretty much any salesperson, the two skills that it would come down to. One would be get more at-bats. Now, to get more at-bats, you don't have control over marketing. You can call them up. You can ask them to do a webinar, do a mailing, do a, a whatever, an event of some kind, and they may cooperate. And the results will vary. A little bit of influence, not much control. What do you have control over? Ah, some of your time some of your networking capabilities. And there is a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week, 365-days-a-year trade show going on right now called the Internet. And it never turns off, but it's, it's a lot. So how do you take that and prioritize it and get it to work for you? Well, that's start the conversation, get the meeting, and get away from the pitch. It's not... Uh, a smarter pitch. It's how to connect with strangers. And when you hear the success stories, because th this is the pattern everybody goes through, uh, excitement, sign up for it, fight me for about two or three weeks, then try it uh, for a week. And all of a sudden they get start getting success. People are replying, people are engaging. Conversations are beginning, then become an advocate. That's so you, you could skip the fight me part, but that seems to be necessary. And when people uh, say, does it work? Well, when I can take somebody who's never sold, somebody who's either in college or right out of college, or somebody whose English is a second language from another country and teach them this, and within a month, their calendar is full, well, you tell me if it can work. Now, these aren't people who are like biting to buy. They're people willing to talk. But that's where you start. 
You, you don't go up to somebody in a bar and say you want to get married. You, you start where you are. You start where they are, and you build step by step. Now, that makes sense, right? Well, guess what? In sales, is similar. You can't go up to say, hey, here's my pitch. What do you think? Give me some objections. Let me handle them. I'm going to handle your objections. Now, 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 once you get these meetings, then you have to build a sale, build a interaction. And it's a lot more than what marketing and sales enablement says. They tell you it's a, you know, present, demo, maybe a proof of concept, propose, negotiate, and then close. Well, if that works, congratulations, you're in the tornado. You're in the, the demand fulfillment business. You're not in the sales business. Most of us, what do we do? We, we, we present, they want a quote, it dies. They don't know how to get it done internally. They need it. They want it. They can afford it, but they don't know how to get it done. And this is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. 100% of the kickoff meetings I did, this is the problem. The symptoms sounded different. They're like, ah, well, we, we need to increase our win rate. We need to have more control over our deals. We need to get deals bigger, pipeline more predictable. But it all kind of boils down to... Do they want your product? Yes, there's a market for it, clearly. you got to tend. If you're beyond $2 million, you're there. There's somewhat of a product market fit. Uh, can they afford it? You can tell that before you have the first call. You can go on the internet. The internet can tell you if they have money or not. Does the product match? They'll tell you. Does the proof of concept go well? Does the demo go well? They like it. If they want a proposal, they're at least curious. And then it dies or it appears to not happen. You don't get the order. Why you don't get the order, you can rationalize yourself. So winning the complex sale solves that problem. And you could wait a year to take the course. Okay. All you have to do is take the income that you want to make versus minus out the income you're going to make. And that's what the, the cost of it is. But it's not just taking the course. It's applying it, it's participating it in the course, it's listening to the one-on-ones, showing up for the office hours, pushing back when something doesn't work, asking questions, how can it be better? Because your audience, you are my audience, your audience is your market, your customers. If you're not getting the response that you'd like, you got to change your approach. Or change your audience. (laughs) Good luck with that. How we become better at sales is an evolution, not a switch. Start the evolution today. Because there's no pause button. There's no wait. Oh, I'll be back. We can all take vacation. I, I loved having this discussion about vacation. Because everyone thinks going on vacation, the world stops. The bills stop. Uh, customers, oh yeah, I'll wait till you get back. Maybe they will. Or there might be an alternative. You can't stop time. doesn't mean you can't take time off. It does mean that if you want the objective that you want, you've got to act. You've got to take some calories and burn them, a couple of dollars and invest them, and make you are the means of production and sales. What everyone wants to do is turn every sales team into a revenue machine. But guess what? Unless you're processing orders, it's a human thing. That's why they hired humans. If they could do it without humans, they would. They hire humans, but then they treat them like machines, and it doesn't work. What we have to do is become great salespeople. Hey, Are you aware of the other podcasts, Sales Questions, Brutally Honest Answers? If you're looking for a short form, quick hitting Q&A type podcast, check it out. Sales Questions, Brutally Honest Answers. If you're in leadership, I've got two leadership podcasts, the Sales Leadership Show, as well as the B2B Revenue Show. Also, I, I store all these interviews up on YouTube as well as all the funny videos, and there's plenty of instruction type videos. 
Tell a friend about the show. If you see me on LinkedIn flying by, uh, give it a little like, a little comment, a little share. Tag a friend in the little comments. That'd be great. You know how to tag? Use a little at sign and then their name. If you know somebody you'd like to hear on the show, hit me up on LinkedIn. Uh, kind of busy, but I'd love to have great guests on the show. Appreciate you listening. We'll see you next time.